This is Star Talk. So, uh, welcome back to Star Talk. Um, yes! Star Talk Live, as you may infer, at the Mo Marine Memorial Theater, San Francisco, California, at Sketchfest. 13th anniversary here in 2014 is reckoned in the common era. And if you're just joining us, I'm Bill Nye, the science guy, CEO of the Planetary Society, sitting in for my dear friend and colleague, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And here on stage in this fabulous theater and venue, I have three other people. <laughs> Our regular Eugene Merman is here. Visiting from uh, my co-worker on Stargate Atlantis, among other things, Dave Foley. And uh, a man who really searches the heavens, listening for signs of life, uh, Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. If you remember last time, uh, thank you, we had a little input from the audience. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I, we'll, we'll press on. <laughs> so, Seth, I very much enjoy and am fascinated by the history of the search for extraterrestrial, especially the speculation about what's living elsewhere. But what's going on now in the search? Well, what's going on now is that we're continuing to do radio searches, in other words, using big antennas to try and eavesdrop on ET. Where and, are these antennas? Well. The ones we use are about uh, 300 miles north of where we're all sitting here tonight in San Francisco. So they're up in the Cascade Mountains of uh, California. For those of you who are local, you can just go up I-5 to Redding, and that's a very interesting drive. Okay. <laughs> and those who aren't local. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dave. We'll <laughs> those... Text us, text us, Dave. <laughs> then you pull yeah. over, not while you're driving. Make a right turn, go for about an hour and a half into the mountains. They're there not because of the cuisine. They're there because, in fact, it's shielded by these mountains from all the you know, radio noise from the San Francisco It's really area. effective in our modern world of today in which we now live that this Hat Creek Valley is uh, noiseless or quiet? It's not noiseless, but it's, it's not because of noise from cities like San Francisco, actually. It's noisy simply because we now have telecommunications satellites wheeling overhead all the time. And, of course, they have transmitters, and you know, that gets down the valley. Good wheeling, yeah. Boop, boop. Mm -hmm. Except yeah. they're in outer space, so they just go. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. in outer space, no one can hear you. Boop, boop. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, Seth, in our first in our first segment, you asserted, you claimed that in the next twenty five years, we we're going to get a signal. Well, I didn't say that, but I will. Yeah. <laughs> well, how are you going to say that? Well, no, I, I said in this century, but. I, 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 think, I think your number's a good one. I think the next couple of dozen years may do it. And if you want to know why I think that... It yeah, could, well, yeah, kind of. I, mean, I feel maybe, like... Maybe you do. We're all fairly curious. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, Bill's ready to punch you over this. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. huh. Not well, over this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's like... Looking for a needle in a haystack. If somebody said, look, you know, there's a needle in a haystack over there. And you, you want to make an estimate, how long is it going to take me to find that needle? It only depends on three things. How big is the haystack? How fast are you going through the hay? And how many needles are in there? Now, in the case of looking for ET, we know how big the haystack is. It's, it's pretty fast talking. So say it again. Needle in a haystack. How big is the haystack? Is, is, is needle, big, yeah. So the okay. okay. haystack <laughs> is the entire known universe? No, heavens no. Heavens no, get it? Yeah. Huh? Oh, so... So the, so the haystack is, is a trillion is, is planets. He, is he going to explain my jokes? Okay, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the galaxy, right? Oh. I mean, if, he, if there isn't any other intelligent life in the galaxy, I mean, you, why look at another galaxy, right? I mean, it's like saying, uh, you think there are any other mammals in North America, and if it turns out there aren't any, then does it really pay to also look in South America? Right. So, so, Unless you're talking about the year negative 20. No. <laughs> No, I wish what? I, huh? <laughs> I, meant, I meant to say like 10,000 A, C, D, C. <laughs> okay. But You're it talking said, about said negative 20. You see which this is whole no, no time way that anyone dilation does time. deal. Yeah. Doctor, Dr. Shostak. Yeah. 
Okay, I'll, I'll finish this up. This, this idea is it's too complex, apparently. But you, look, so you need to know <laughs> how big is a haystack, how fast are you going through it, how many needles are in there. In the case of looking for ET, the haystack is our galaxy. Let's look in our galaxy. 200 billion stars. Roughly, plus or minus three. Right. <laughs> how, how fast are we going through the hay? That we know. That's, that's a technical question. And we know how quickly we'll go through the hay for the next 10 or 20 years as well. That you can sort of predict How technology. fast is that? A well, star a second? And no, nothing like a star a second. But the speed actually follows something that's a very famous relationship here near the Silicon Valley, namely Moore's Law. In other words, it doubles in speed every 18 months. So that will continue for another decade or two. The only thing you don't know is how many needles are in there. I mean, you know how many aliens are in there. But there are people who've guessed, like Carl Sagan has guessed, Isaac Asimov guessed, you know, Frank Drake has guessed. And have you, you guessed? Yeah. Eugene? I, I, uh, I have, I have uh, 80, but what's your guess that's going to be more accurate? <laughs> 80 may be good, Eugene. I mean, I don't know. But if it isn't at least a few thousand, then this is going to take longer. But if it's as many as 10,000, right? 10,000 stars with planets with that are habitable and so on. And not only habitable, but there's some inhabitants that are broadcasting. But they'd stuff. have to be at our level of technological advancement. No, they can be more advanced. They can't oh, oh be sorry, but they couldn't. How much less than us could they be? Not much. Nothing. Okay. 50 years. Uh, yeah. we're, we're the basic. We're they the dumbest. We're the people yeah. who are like years and they negatives. They have to at least be at like Marconi phase. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, not even that. Or it Tesla, if you want to really be honest about it. They would have to have. <laughs> Marconi was a fucking asshole. Tesla, Tesla had a belief in this, yeah? He did. Tesla thought he'd heard the Martians. Nikola Tesla. Yeah. After yeah. whom, what's a Tesla, anyone? They, they named him after a car. It's yeah. a Weber per square meter. A delicious salami. <laughs> I know that's not true. Jesus, people. <laughs> Good with sauerkraut. But he was a guy who, after whom we have a magnetic uh, unit of flux named, yes? And he was the guy who pioneered direct current uh, energy transmission and the crazy Al alternating current. All, yeah. alter mm -hmm. sorry, alternating current. Alternating current transmission right through the air and all that. Everybody's just going to glow. Yeah. And along with that, he speculated. Well, he built this big tower for his wireless power transmission scheme, which, by the way, did work. The trouble is, it also conveyed power to your hair and everything mm -hmm. else. But, but he eventually built the generators, you know this, uh, at Niagara Falls. That was the important thing for Westinghouse. Mm -hmm. Bit of electrical engineering history. To, it's, it's, it's good for what's Double left ease. of your soul. Yes. Right, that's right. And he and Edison were dread enemies. That's true. Yeah. 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 Edison Killing elephants left and right. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, that's a, that's we a digress. bit apocryphal. But okay, okay. In any case, Tesla had this big tower outside uh, in, in Colorado. I think it was Fort Collins. But in any case, and the idea was he was doing these experiments, and he found, he found these signals coming in on it, radio signals. And he thought, these are the Martians. It was sort of jumping to conclusions. Uh, probably they were what are called whistlers, which are caused by electrical storms that just produce uh, you know, electromagnetic disturbances, radio waves in the atmosphere that propagate around. Like okay. from lightning, while you're, lightning. while you're producing light. You Not the Martians, it was lightning. You produce yeah. sprites and radio waves and stuff. So he was wrong about that. He was wrong about that, yeah. But and that's why he was the greatest astronomer <laughs> ever. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point something out to you, Dave, at the risk of being too serious here. But any scientist who's never made a mistake is probably not a great scientist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also, a scientist that only found Uranus is simply pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but it's not all he found. <laughs> oh, what else did he find? <laughs> He did. <laughs> All right. I can't tell who was more sexual based on your reaction and then his laugh. So, uh, we, sp I remember very well, uh, I was in Carl Sagan's astronomy class. <laughs> I know some of you are skeptical. It was, I'm sure it was some sort of clerical error at the university, but I was in the class and he's, they speculated at that time that about one in a hundred stars would have planets. Mm -hmm. And now we speculate that every star has a planet, or two, mm -hmm. or eight, or more. And that one out of five has an Earth-like planet. Is that right, Seth? Is that well, a yeah, current there was number? A, there was indeed a result announced a couple of months ago. Dave's right. Uh, this was an analysis. You don't have to sound so. It, it That's why I am a terrible <laughs> astronomer. <laughs> This, this, this was an analysis done by some 
guys at a state institution across the Bay Area, the name escapes me. But they, they published this result. They did a preliminary analysis of data. If you're scoring along with us, it's University of California, Berkeley? Yeah. Not, not everybody's here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, so, and, and their estimate was that sun-like stars, maybe uh, you know, 30, 40% of them might have an Earth-like world, 20 to 40%. Red dwarf stars, which dominate the heavens. These dominate. Little, the little runty guys. <laughs> Somewhere between maybe 15% and 40, 50% of them might have a habitable planet. So bottom line, you average it all together, you weight by the number, and then I'm the bottom line is if you that can't indeed, see him, he's Dave is right. Hands. Roughly one in five stars will not only have a planet, but a planet that might be salubrious enough for you to go into the business of constructing condos on it because it would have you know, liquid oceans and maybe some air. So if you have 200 billion stars mm -hmm. in our galaxy, that's, well, that's a lot of habitable planets. 40 billion. 40 billion in our galaxy. Right. If you so you like start doing the universe, anymore. you get into hundreds of billions. And then it's just whether intelligence evolved on any of them. Right. Yeah. And life, for that yeah. matter. Yeah. No one's well, are you saying joke. that intelligence no that is make not alive? <laughs> is that a fear? Is that, that sounds like something we should be afraid of. <laughs> a planet that evolved a dead intelligence? <laughs> well, Eugene, look at it this way. I mean, we said earlier that one of the great advances of this century, probably the thing that people will remember the most about this century, they remembered it all, is that we invented thinking machines. Now a lot of you think, I ain't never I think do it'll that. be Lindsay Lohan. You might, yes. You will, but not yeah. 500 years from now. Okay. So, Codes that can write notes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I could have said camera. <laughs> <laughs> but once you do that, once you build a thinking machine, the first thing you ask is, you design something smarter than you are. And then you ask that machine, you design something smarter than you are. And within 20 years, you have a machine that's smarter than all humans put together. So, well, the scenario... That's a good thing? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's yeah. a good thing, but it's an inevitable thing. And the point is that most of the intelligence out there is probably synthetic. And probably in their, you know, synthetic brain somewhere, they went, oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, somewhere back in the past, we were soft and squishy and organic. That must have been terrible. Oh. oh. Wait, so you're saying whatever life was there died, but had first created something smart... That kept creating smarter things, and they now don't, they don't have to die. They don't have to die, but they, they might. Have. Like oh wait, cats. so there might be a lot. Oh, so there. But anyway, there could be super smart intelligence that is artificial that has now moved on. They, another planet had a singularity. So, Seth, is this a just so story that, in other words, we build computers, so we infer that we figure that somebody else, everybody else, is building computers, building machines smarter than they are. Yeah, you're right. That maybe it's a just so story, and maybe 99 out of 100. A hundred of them don't do that. They just sit around with their wees or contemplating their navel or whatever they're doing. Okay? Those are the only two options. <laughs> <laughs> what is my navel? Ooh. I can play golf. That's great, Eugene. You just simplified my life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Just well, a little. Yeah, yeah but, but if one of them does it, you see, that intelligence becomes so incredible that it really doesn't matter what the others do. Yeah. Yes, so tell us about that. We, what happens to the Earth when we get a signal? Well, most people, you walk the streets of San Francisco, and you ask people, what do you think would happen if scientists 300 miles north of here pick up a signal? Most people say, well, the government would shut it all down. And really? Yeah. They'll give you a 90-minute speech about organic food. <laughs> <laughs> They're monsters. <laughs> That, that's what the public thinks. They, they, they think it would all be kept quiet. And when I ask them, why do you think that? They say, because the public couldn't handle the news. Do, 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 do. Could you handle the news? If you picked up your newspaper tomorrow, you won't do that. Picked up your browser tomorrow, and you read, you know, scientists find signal coming from 800 light years away. Would you say, that's it? I'm not going to work today? Is that what you do? Yeah. Would you ride in the streets? No, you wouldn't do any of that. We, we have historical precedent. You wouldn't do that. It would just be a very interesting story. So Are you sure we would wouldn't have to burn somebody at the stake? Oh, <laughs> yes. Somebody would somewhere, but... We would murder One Direction. <laughs> <laughs> and then move on. <laughs> so... Because then our hearts were good. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, uh, I claim... It would, dare I say it, change the world. It would be, humans would be humbled yet again. 
But already most people believe aliens are already visiting the Earth. You're talking about my old boss, aren't you? <laughs> but I'm saying most yeah. people, most, the, the majority of people... But it's not the majority. You're, you're talking third. about Americans. The majority third. of third. Americans. Third. Third. You guys are talking about the History Americans Channel, right? Believe that aliens <laughs> visit here. Yeah. yeah. How many people watch that show? How many people watch that show? Which one? Which Ancient one? Aliens. Ancient oh. Aliens. Oh, those are horrible, yeah. <laughs> but, Is it a show called Misinformation? But if we, <laughs> if we heard that there were aliens, if we got proof that there were aliens, I think most people would just go, well, yeah. Well, that, that may be part of the reason why they wouldn't ride in the streets. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're all, they're already here. That and people were fat and lazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like the old days when they'd riot in the yeah. streets. Yeah. Those people. <laughs> but it, apparently, there were never those old days, really. I mean, there's always a, a, a small group that'll pick Tell up some Bruno about it. pitchforks and so forth. <laughs> I think most people were, you know, going to a night restaurant or whatever. They weren't bothering with Bruno. But so what would actually happen is it would simply be a very interesting story. If you could understand anything they were saying, now that would be good because, remember, they can't be less intelligent or less technically advanced than you are because then they're not making any radio waves that we could pick up. So they're at least at our level, and it's very unlikely that they're within 100 years of our level. They'd, they'd be thousands, millions, conceivably billions of years more advanced. Suppose you could get information from a society that's millions of years more advanced than ours, right? Here's the cure for death, here's how to get along, whatever. Now, would that be interesting, or would you say, no, I'm just gonna ride in the streets? That is a very, yeah. that is a very hopeful view. Is this uh, not working? Yeah. Uh-oh. Test a, oh, yeah, now it's working. Yeah, they got the I was going to say, that is a very hopeful view. We were like, here's, the, here's uh, how, to not, how to avoid death and all that. But they could also come here and be like, you now do all our chores. <laughs> yeah. It's people. It's what, people. Yeah. What, what if they show up here at the same time that the Lakers win a championship? <laughs> yeah, people are And they on think the, the riot is about them. <laughs> well, there's no shortage of unrest but what's so what is so fantastic seriously everybody about this pursuit to me and really you know what I'm involved in albeit in a peripheral way circumferential way is that going to Mars uh, exploring space sending spacecraft to Saturn spacecraft we hope to Europa and uh, uh, Titan these are moons of uh, Jupiter and Saturn respectively is that it's optimistic there's this thing within us that uh, that that the future is going to be better, and we're going to build spacecraft, and we're going to look out there and find out what's going on. Because the more we learn about our solar systemic neighborhood, the better off we're going to be. And the more we learn about radio signals in our galaxy, the better off we're going to be. And that is still something that I, I think, drives all of us: is this, this optimism through space exploration. Now, well, I, thank you, Eugene. But you know, if you're not sure. No, but how close, so how close is, in light years, is the closest inhabitable planet, can, or Earth-like planet? Can you hold that thought? I literally can. <laughs> <laughs> it is no problem. Because Forget it. Because we, <laughs> here we are, we're going to, uh, we're, we're at the uh, Marine Memorial Theater at Sketch Fest 13 in San Francisco, California, USA, Star Talk Radio Live, and we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. 